It is a pleasure to be here. Amen. I don't know if I'd want to be anywhere else on the Lord's Day uh, rather than with my brothers and sisters worshiping God. Amen. When we look at the uh, book of Numbers, uh, I believe it could have been a glorious account of God's people leaving Egypt, marching through the wilderness, and taking the land that God had promised them. But sadly, that is not what we find. Instead, when you read the book of Numbers, you see that the nation of Israel uh, complained against God. They lacked faith uh, in Jehovah. And because of that, ultimately, they spent 40 years, at least the older generation, spent 40 years wandering in that desert uh, until they passed away. This evening, I'd like us to read from the book of Numbers. So if you have uh, your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open it uh, to Numbers with me. The book of Numbers. And the, uh, the title, Numbers, seems kind of odd. And I don't know if you ever looked at why, why it is called Numbers. But uh, for whatever reason, it's called Numbers because of the two times the people of Israel were numbered. Uh, you know, the census that was taken. But really, that's only a small part of this book's uh, narrative. Uh, my understanding is in the Hebrew, the title for this book is In the Wilderness. And I believe that is a better title, and a, a better description of what this book is all about. It's about Israel's time uh, in the wilderness. In Numbers 14, uh, verses... Uh, 22 and following. It says, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall see the land, uh, or sorry, surely they shall not see the land uh, which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them uh, that provoked me see it. And so we see, you know, here. Uh, really, God just uh, fed up with the way they behaved. As we read through this account, we'll see he gave them many opportunities to change their attitude, to change their ways, and uh, it just you know, really uh, wasn't happening. Uh, after being set free from slavery in Egypt, uh, the Israelites had a long journey ahead of, uh, ahead of them. They were to uh, march through the uh, Sinai Peninsula. And so as, as Christians, we too have a journey that we must make, and uh, our journey is our journey through this life. And we look forward to uh, a promised land, and we can either choose to walk with God and live by faith, uh, or we can be like uh, Israel, uh, who lacked faith. And so we're going to start in Numbers chapter 11, Numbers chapter 11, and we'll look at the first few verses here, and we see... Uh, this is really the beginning of the count when uh, the people start to uh, murmur. They start to murmur, they start to uh, uh, complain. And it says in verses 1 and following, When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And so why did the fire of the Lord burn among uh, the people? Well, we can see you know, pretty clearly here it's because uh, they complained. And as you keep reading the context here, you, you see that they were complaining about food. Now, food is, is important, but God had provided food for them. God had provided food. Uh, manna for them to eat. And so it wasn't the case that they had no food. It's they wanted the food like they had back in Egypt. If you go down uh, to verse 5, chapter 11, verse 5, it says, We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions uh, and the garlic. And notice this, it says in verse 6, But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. 
So again, it wasn't that they lacked food. It was, again, they were complaining about what God had uh, provided them. And again, their situation in the wilderness, it wasn't meant to be a permanent situation. You know, they were only going to be there for the allotted time that God wanted them to be there as they you know, moved through that land and eventually went into the land um, of, of Cana. Uh, not too long ago, uh, I did mention complaining in one of my sermons, and that was one of the major topics. So instead of rehashing that, if you turn with me to Acts uh, 18, uh, I'd like to talk about what is, I think, related to complaining, but it's kind of the opposite of complaining. Uh, I'd like to talk about constructive criticism. Uh, constructive criticism. And I think uh, what we find in Acts 18 uh, is a great example uh, of this. Acts 18, let's begin reading with verse uh, 24. Uh, Acts 18, verse 24. <clears throat> and it says, A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And if I can stop, you know, there, this was clearly a time when John's baptism had been supplanted by uh, Jesus' baptism, what Jesus commanded. Uh, continuing in verse 26, it says, He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expanded unto him the way of God more perfectly or more uh, accurately. And so I think this is a great example of uh, constructive criticism. Here's a man who is doing his best, he's been being diligent, and says he's teaching things accurately, diligently, but there's one you know, vital piece of information that he just doesn't know yet, and that's the baptism of Jesus Christ. And uh, we should keep in mind this is a, a time when the scriptures are still being revealed, they're still being written down, and if you wanted to hear the inspired word of God, you had to uh, go to either the apostles or you had to go someone, to someone who had the gift of prophecy, and you had to hear from them. And so he is teaching accurately, but he is uh, still teaching the baptism of John. And so notice what uh, Aquila and Priscilla do, these, these, uh, this uh, godly Christian couple. Uh, they don't, you know, uh, rebuke him or correct him in the, the middle of the assembly or among a group of, of other people. Uh, the text says they, you know, they took him aside. And uh, then they uh, expounded uh, unto him the way of God uh, more uh, perfectly. And so I think that's a great example of not only receiving uh, criticism, but also uh, giving it as well. We should think of uh, uh, people's feelings and how they might react. And uh, again, maybe it's, it's better to take people aside if we have something important we want to, uh, want to tell them. In Proverbs 15, verse 32, it says, He that refuses instruction despises his own soul, but he that hears reproof gets understanding. And, uh, you know, there, there's always, you know, a balance we have to have in, in learning and talking to people. And we don't want to be pushy. We don't want to be a know-it-all. But also we want to be able to, you know, receive criticism and not, you know, overreact and not be, you know, uh, um, thin-skinned or anything like that. We have to be willing to receive instruction. And uh, that's what this proverb is all about. You know, someone who uh, hates reproof and is not willing to listen to others, uh, they're, they're cutting themselves off from information that might be uh, important. And it is beneficial to listen to brethren uh, who've read the Bible, who've studied the Bible for years and years, and get their input and get their uh, insight uh, and various things. And with that said, it's always important for us to do our own study, going to the source, uh, going to the Bible ourselves, and reading it and studying it, uh, because we are all individually uh, accountable to God for what we do uh, with the knowledge that we have from, uh, from His Word. In Philippians 2, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, uh, as you not always obeyed, uh, sorry, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, 
but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear uh, and trembling. And so here we see, you know, individual responsibility. You know, we all have to uh, work out our own salvation uh, before God. And that's something we should do with the utmost uh, concern and reverence for uh, our uh, eternal destiny. And, you know, as a gospel preacher, all I can really ever do is do my best to share with you what the Bible says and do it in hopefully an understandable way and encourage you to act on the information revealed in Scripture. But then other than that, I mean, it's all up to you. You know, we can't force people to believe. Uh, we can't force them to obey. Uh, we all as individuals must decide to what degree we're going to devote ourselves uh, to God and to His Word. And so we're told here to work out our own salvation with fear uh, and trembling. And so when we look at the account of Apollos, uh, he had a decision to make. You know, once he received this information from Aquila and Priscilla, he had to determine what he was going to do with it. And uh, the text doesn't say specifically, uh, but as you read uh, Acts 18 and verse 19, I believe it is implied that he heard what they said and uh, he put that into to action. And so as we consider Israel and their actions in the wilderness, uh, they were not involved in constructive criticism. And we'll see not only were they complaining against God, but in a moment we'll see they turned on Moses and Aaron as well on several occasions. Uh, they weren't interested in helping Moses or helping Aaron or coming to God with, you know, in humbleness with the concern they had. They were just involved in complaining, you know, having a lack uh, of faith. And uh, as we'll keep on reading, we'll see there even came a time where they wanted to go back to Egypt, where they actually started making plans to go back to Egypt where they were uh, enslaved. And so when we return to the book of Numbers, uh, and they said, you know, they, they missed all the tasty food that they had in Egypt. In essence, they're telling God, hey, we had it better in slavery, you know, compared to what you're doing to us here uh, in, this, uh, in this desert. Uh, in Numbers chapter 12, we read how Moses is uh, challenged here by his brother and sister, uh, by Aaron and uh, Miriam. Uh, Numbers chapter 12. Uh, let's look at the first uh, several verses, Numbers 12, verses uh, 1 through 3. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all men which were upon the face of of the earth. And you know, here's a good reminder that meekness uh, is not weakness. When you look at the life of Moses, uh, he did some amazing things. You know, he appeared before the Pharaoh saying, let my people go. You know, that's a meek man. He's obeying the word of God. Uh, meekness is not weakness. But here we see uh, opposition from Miriam and Aaron. And uh, it mentions the wife he had married. Uh, the Ethiopian, or perhaps your translation will say the Cushite uh, woman. And uh, this was likely Zipporah, who was the daughter of Jethro. Uh, Moses married her when he lived in Midian uh, prior to God sending him to Egypt and, and speaking to the Pharaoh. And so the text here says that they complained against Moses uh, because of his wife. And I'm not exactly sure what that means. I, I have an educated guess. Uh, according to Exodus 15, verse 20, uh, Miriam was a prophetess, and she probably had a prominent role among the women of Israel. Uh, if you recall in that, that passage in Exodus 15, uh, she led out the women to sing a, a psalm, and she sang a prophetic psalm. And perhaps Miriam thought she would be supplanted by Moses' wife. You know, after all, Moses is this great leader. Why wouldn't his wife have a prominent role uh, among the people? And I think it's interesting when we read this, uh, when you look at verse 1, Miriam's name 
is placed before uh, Aaron's name. And when you scroll down to verse 10, uh, ultimately they were punished because of their insurrection, because of their rebellion against Moses. And in verse 10, uh, Miriam is the one who received the punishment from God. It just says Aaron, she got leprosy, and it just says Aaron looked at her. Uh, and so whatever the case may be, again, that's just, I think, an educated guess. Maybe she was upset with Zipporah because she, she might have thought Zipporah would have taken a more prominent role than her. I don't know. Again, that's just a guess. Um, but whatever the case may be, both uh, Miriam uh, and Aaron questioned Moses' leadership. And that really is the bottom line. When you look at verse 2, in that question, they said, has, has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? And the idea is there, you know, aren't we also inspired individuals? Aren't we God's children as well? Uh, why are you, you know, leading the people the way you are? And so they were questioning, uh, questioning his leadership. And as we look at this passage, we can see a, a great verse that shows us the uh, uniqueness of Moses. Uh, same chapter, verses uh, 6 and following. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently or evidently, and not in dark speeches, and in uh, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant uh, Moses? And so Moses was very unique. I don't know of any other prophet where it said of, said of a prophet of God where he spoke to the Lord face to face or mouth to mouth. And I believe this is said because Moses is uh, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. I believe he is an antitype of Jesus' uh, ministry. Jesus was a prophet of God. And uh, if Moses uh, spoke with God mouth to mouth, then uh, I don't know how you say how Jesus revealed God. Uh, Jesus completely revealed God. He is uh, God in the flesh. It says in John 1.18 that no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, uh, He hath declared Him. He has made Him known. And so through Christ and His, His ministry and what Jesus has done in this world, uh, Jesus has fully and completely uh, made God known. He made God known in a way that Moses uh, was never allowed to. And so God answered Aaron and Miriam's complaint uh, by reaffirming Moses as the, uh, as the leader of the people. And uh, this is important for us to, to, to consider because later on his leadership is challenged uh, numerous times by the people. Next, we read about the 12 spies going into the land uh, of Canaan and spying out the land. And this is uh, in Numbers chapter uh, 13. The 12 spies are sent out into uh, the land where they you know, eventually come back and give a report to the people. In Numbers 13, verses 1 and following, it says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And so one man for each tribe, and that's why there's you know, 12 spies. So these 12 men are sent out into Canaan to report about the land and then come back. And let's go down to verse uh, 30, chapter 13, verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that uh, we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, 
which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And so Caleb and Joshua, two of these 12 men, they brought back a positive report. And Caleb just said, let us go at once. Let us take it. Let's take what God has promised. And Joshua was, was with them in, in, in that. Uh, the other spies, they were pessimistic. They said, there, there's no way. The people there are, are giants. And I think it's interesting. You know, look at verse 33. It says, the people became as grasshoppers in the eyes of who? You know, in their own eyes. You see that? In their own eyes, they became uh, as grasshoppers. And uh, their, their pessimism was contagious. Look at 14 verse, chapter 14, verse 1. All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And so, you know, we ought to be careful not to give in to, you know, negative, uh, a negative way of thinking, a pessimistic uh, outlook on life, uh, because that can be uh, contagious as we, uh, as we see here. Uh, so whether we face literal giants or figurative ones, uh, you know, if we're faithful to God, we ought to know that His will is going to be done no matter what. And uh, our attitude should be the, the attitude revealed in Romans 8, where it says, you know, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No, no outward force, nothing in this world can ever separate us from the love of God. And so when God makes a promise... Uh, he is faithful to his word, and he promised the people through Abraham many times, through uh, Abraham's sons, that they would receive that land. And they were, they, uh, they were afraid because they saw the, the people of the land and how they were great, and they feared the people instead of fearing the one who, uh, who created the, uh, the giants. And then in Numbers 14, verses 1 and following, it talks about them uh, weeping that night, and in verses 2 and following, it says, All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? And they get their prayer later on, sadly. They do die in the wilderness. Uh, verse 3, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. And so again, we see the people uh, almost instantly return to murmuring. And uh, the rebellion, rebellion had come to the point where they're ready to appoint a captain and just go back. Go back to slavery. You know, how about that? Moses and the other leaders... Uh, Miriam and Aaron, you know, they pleaded with the people to change their minds, to change their heart. And in verses uh, 10 and 11, it says that all the congregation uh, bade stone them with stones. The people turned on Moses. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the, the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. And so when we read about the people uh, complaining here and God uh, chastising them several times and then ultimately the, them uh, passing away in the wilderness, um, God gave them many opportunities to, to change their attitudes, to put their trust in Him, uh, and, and they did not. And so their punishment was not from just one slip up. You know, they made one mistake and God was just ready, waiting to punish them and condemn them. Uh, they were punished because they persisted in their complaining and their infidelity. Uh, we learn from this account that Jehovah is long-suffering, that He is kind. Uh, however, His patience does have an end. And I think we should see that from the Old Testament. A lot of people want to characterize uh, God in the Old Testament as a God of of anger and wrath and just ready to condemn people. Uh, but when you read through Numbers, God was very patient with them. And several times, and you can see here, he's pleading with them, you know, how long before you believe me? You know, after all these things I have, have shown you. And uh, that's, you know, what he asked there in verse 11. Uh, we can benefit from, from God's grace and his patience today. 
Um, but we should understand that you know the time we have in this world is very short. And we should use the little time that we have to be people of faith, men and women of faith, uh, rather than uh, you know a life of infidelity, a life of murmuring uh, against God. Lastly, let's look at the uh, rebellion of Korah, and then we'll go to the uh, quickly go to the New Testament. Uh, this is in Numbers chapter 16. Numbers 16, and we'll just read a few verses from here. Uh, the rebellion of Korah. Let's start with verse 1. Number 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And these rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, saying all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation uh, of the Lord. And so we see once again, uh, Moses' leadership is called into question. And it's this time it's by Men of renown, you know, people in authority, people among uh, the children of Israel, uh, 250 princes of the assembly. That's a lot of people coming to you and challenging you. Could you imagine that many people uh, challenging what you're doing? Uh, and Korah claimed that Moses and Aaron exalted, uh, exalted themselves, that they placed themselves in the, the positions that they had. And we know that statement is not true, that, that God was the one who appointed Moses to draw the people out of Egypt, and God is the one who appointed uh, Aaron to basically uh, help him, and, and Aaron would become the beginning of the Levitical priesthood. And uh, to cut to the chase, the Lord was not pleased with Korah and how he uh, spearheaded this rebellion uh, against Moses and Aaron. If we go down to verses... Uh, 31 and following, and there's a lot There's a lot to this account if you read it. Chapter 16, verses 31 and following. It says, It came to pass, as he hath made an end of speaking, uh, all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. And so uh, the earth just, it says it swallowed them up. And, you know, the earth is personified here as, uh, a, a being with a mouth, and it just swallowed them up, and they were gone. And so God destroyed Korah, not only Korah, all those that uh, were following him and had a part in that uh, rebellion. So once again, he affirmed Moses as the leader uh, of the people. Now you would think, imagine you seeing these events unfold before you. Let's say we're back there, we're part of the assembly, part of the people of Israel. You know, Moses' leadership is challenged by these 200 uh, individuals. They're swallowed up. They're gone. They're dead. How would you respond to that? You know, wouldn't most of us, I hope, respond in reverence and say, all right, God has made his choice, right? You know, let's follow Moses and let's, uh, uh, you know, be faithful. Uh, but again, that's, it's not what happened. And this account really just kind of boggles my mind, even as I was reading through it uh, in preparation for uh, this sermon. You know, after all this has happened, uh, Korah and those of the re rebellion are gone. It says in verse 41, on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. All right. It just it makes me it makes me smile, but it's also you know kind of sad that they're this uh, hard hearted. And again, the, the next verse we see that they gather, get, gather together, they assemble against you know, Moses and Aaron. At this point, you know, God's ready just to wipe them all out. Um, that doesn't happen, but he was at that point. And so just to reiterate once again, when we look at them complaining and God punishing them, this was not a one-time slip-up. This was not... Then acknowledge, okay, I've sinned, I'm going to repent, I'm going to make changes, I'm sorry for what I've done. This is them persistently questioning God, questioning uh, the leadership that God had appointed, and really just complaining uh, to God. 
And so when God did chastise those who were uh, rebellious, uh, those who murmured against Moses, it was after, again, a lot of patience, and a lot of God through Moses asking the people to change their ways. And so the constant rebellion recorded in this, this book is, uh, again, it's kind of mind-boggling how many times they, they turned their back on God and complained about Him. Uh, how could a nation of people, in light of everything that they had seen and experienced, you know, these are the people who endured and went through the ten plagues that came upon Egypt. You know, they experienced crossing the Red Sea on dry ground, the manna from heaven, and all these amazing miracles that God had done. How could they so quickly and aggressively turn their back on God and, and not trust in Him? And the short answer is, I have no idea. You know, you would think after going through all those things that they would at least uh, make it through the wilderness. But they, they didn't. And I think we could think about our, our own nation uh, and compare it to what the people are doing here. Uh, I believe as Americans, we have unprecedented freedom and blessings. Uh, I don't know of any nation in history that has as much freedom and as much wealth as we do as citizens of America. And our nation was founded in 1970, uh, or sorry, 1976, 1776. And uh, so we're uh, about 242 years old as a nation of people. Uh, our national motto is, in God we trust. You know, that's printed on our money. Uh, that's, that's everywhere. And yet how many people today revile those words, uh, hate those words, want to see uh, any mention of God completely removed from the public, from our schools, from anything having to do with, with the government? And, uh, you know, I believe in my lifetime I have seen uh, values change and shift uh, in our nation. We may wonder how Israel and why Israel... Uh, so quickly turned on God, but again, 242 years, you know, that's not a huge amount of time, you know, the big, uh, big scheme of things. Uh, and I believe we have definitely changed our values when you go back and you read some of the, the things concerning our history. Uh, for example, John Quincy Adams, one of our founding fathers, he said in the chain of human events, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of our Savior. The Declaration of Independence laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity, end quote. And so I know that many of our forefathers were not members of the Church of Christ, but there is no doubt when you go back and you actually read their words, they had a, a Christian worldview. They had a theistic uh, worldview. And, you know, John uh, Adams himself said that the uh, Declaration of Independence and our government uh, was founded on the first precepts of Christianity. And uh, I believe that what had, the things that have made our country so great and so prosperous uh, is the fact that it is, in part, based on biblical uh, principles. And uh, I believe that's why we have so much prosperity even, uh, even today. And my hope and my prayer would be that those in the government, those who have uh, power and the ability to inf uh, influence the laws in our land would realize this truth that what makes us great is our values and principles which come from the Bible and that uh, those who are in authority would stop passing uh, legislation in our country uh, which is contrary to the very holy Bible they put their hand on when they swear to protect our nation uh, personally I'd like to see the government repeal laws which kill children, uh, make a mockery of marriage, and uh, allow people to legal, uh, legally obtain uh, mind-altering drugs and alcohol. How far can our nation drift away from God and still expect to be blessed by God? And we can go through the Old Testament. We can see with the people of Israel how you know, God always preserved a remnant, but if it wasn't for his promises made to Abraham... He probably would have been done with the people of Israel. And we can look at, you know, other nations which, which, which really did horrible things and how God exercised judgment uh, on them as well. We could think about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis. And uh, just, you know, things to think about in, in the future of our, of our nation. 
Um, we may not have control of what happens in our culture or in our society, uh, but we do have control of ourselves. And I'd like to finish with this last point, that as Christians, uh, our journey through this life is likened unto uh, the journey of uh, the Israelites, that we also uh, are strangers and pilgrims. If you would, uh, let's turn to 1 Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we learn from uh, this passage that this world is not our permanent home. That uh, we are looking forward to something uh, far better. The Bible says that our citizenship uh, is in heaven and it's there we will ultimately spend uh, eternity. Let's see, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 11. 1 Peter 2, verse 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so Peter styles his audience, uh, uh, sojourners, did I say sojourners? Strangers, sojourners in a different spot. Uh, strangers and uh, pilgrims. And so Israel, again, they were set free from slavery in Egypt, but they were a nation of people, well over, probably well over a million people, but they had no land. They had no government until Moses went to Mount Sinai, but they had no, no place to call home. And so in a real sense, they were, they were vagabonds. They were strangers. They were pilgrims making their way into the land uh, of Canaan. And that's what we are called uh, as Christians. And here we find instructions for how we ought to live our lives uh, in this journey that we are taking. Uh, Peter says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And so we're reminded here that we're in the midst of a battle, a uh, spiritual battle. The lusts of the flesh and the Holy Spirit are at odds with one another. And we must choose what master we're going to submit to. We're either going to submit to God or we're going to submit to uh, the world and its, and its lusts. And we saw from the Old Testament how patient God was with the people, uh, how long-suffering He was. He gave them many opportunities to reconsider and to have a change of heart. And I believe we can expect the same thing from God uh, in our lives. And we should understand that He is gracious, that He is long-suffering. However, we also learn from that account that His patience did come to an end. And, you know, ultimately God's patience is going to come to end in our lives today when we pass away and we stand before him in judgment. And it's either going to be, you know, yes or no. It's going to be one or the other. And so that is the definite time his patience will, will come to end. But here and now, uh, we do have uh, the grace of God. In Romans 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is the next verse. He says, May it never be. God forbid. And so we mustn't use God's grace and His love uh, as a reason to, to commit sin or to continue in sin. Uh, we should realize that His grace exists uh, so that we can make changes and that we can uh, live more, more faithfully. Backing up in Romans, Romans 2 verse 4, uh, it says, Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. That's how we should think about God's grace, His goodness, the love that He shows us. It's there so, so that it will lead us to repentance, to have a change of heart and, and to follow Him and be, uh, be faithful. And we see, I think, that goodness in the account of numbers. Many times God was waiting for them to repent, to change. And uh, the people did not. The people of Israel looked forward to Canaan, they looked forward to the promised land. Uh, they would receive a physical blessing. They would receive that inheritance uh, of actually having a land as a nation of people. And in time, they would become a kingdom. Uh, they would become a, a kingdom, a nation in this world. The Old Testament, as the saying goes, is the New Testament concealed and the new is the old revealed. 
And when we look, uh, when we think about ourselves as Christians in light of the New Testament, uh, we too look forward to receive blessings from God, land from God, a kingdom from God. But we do not look forward to, uh, to physical uh, blessings. We look forward to spiritual blessings. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You know, we seek and we search for a continuing city as God's people today. And we too are a nation of people. We too form a kingdom, but we are a spiritual kingdom with our king currently reigning in heaven, not on earth. We sing a, a hymn and it says, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You know, knowing that we're going through a time of, of testing, a time of trials, a time where we are strangers and pilgrims waiting for something greater to come, let us learn from the book of Numbers not to lose faith in God, not to constantly question and, and bicker against what God has done for us. No matter what we face, let us have faith in God and wait for the earnest expectation uh, for the return of our King and the fulfillment of the promises uh, that He has made. I'd like to leave you with this verse, Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29. It says, Wherefore, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved in a spiritual kingdom, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire.